Hello and welcome to Red Dot Hot Takes, the second episode. My name is Hosan Leong. Let's jump straight into introducing my guests for today. I want to say hi to Christine. Hi. Hi. Tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Christine Sun mm -hmm. from Orange Tea & Thai. Uh, our company is one of the largest uh, property agencies in Singapore. And uh, for myself, I do research mm. on uh, property trends and also provide uh, quite regular commentaries in the mainstream media about property uh, developments. Yeah, mm, We should chat later. I'll ask you for yeah, some advice, certainly. you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, my next guest is Darren So. Hello. Hi. Tell us about yourself. My name is Darren So. Yeah. I am an architectural photographer. I've been doing this for the last 15 years or so. And uh, I have an obsession with photographing the HDB uh, heartlands of Singapore. And you've literally put Singapore on the map through your photographs. Well, um, Sometimes. Can I ask, uh, why the HDB uh, blocks? Uh, why, why is this obsession? How did it come about? Because uh, Singapore is one of the world, if if not the world's best public housing program, uh, it's widely recognized. We're not just blowing our own trumpet here. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt that, you know, because it's so good, we need to document it properly. Okay, and our next guest, uh, of course, Minister for National Development, Desmond Lee, a very warm welcome, or should I say a red hot welcome to you. <laughs> How are you? you? Thank you, Hosan, and I'm happy to have uh, Christine and Darren here with us today. Okay. I'm, I'm good, uh, busy. Yeah. Uh, I, I work in the Ministry of National Development. Uh, we look after public housing, uh, urban development. Mm. Uh, we also look after greenery and conservation, both uh, nature conservation, heritage conservation, and of course, the real estate sector. Okay, fantastic. Well, that's a huge job undertaking. <laughs> now, Red Dot Hot Takes, and every week, we talk about the pillars and topics um, about the Forward SG exercise. In our previous episode, we had DPM Lawrence Wong together with entertainer Belinda Lee and uh, clinical psychologist Maimuna Mosley talking about the the broad overview of Forward SG. Now, if you haven't already watched it, go check it out on the link, which we'll post somewhere later, don't worry. As part of the Forward SG exercise, we talk about the pillars or the things that are important to the country. And last episode, we spoke about the social compact, which is how we relate to each other in the various aspects of our lives. And that has divided nicely into six pillars. So let's see if I can get them right, okay? Um, so, Desmond, you are in charge of the build. 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 Okay, got one. Mm. Do you know the rest? Anyone? Empower. Empower. Care. 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 We have equip. We have steward. And unite along with build, of course. And today, we're going to talk about the build pillar, which covers our housing and living environment. And that's why we are here today. And with Minister Desmond, perhaps you'd like to kick us off with a little overview about why are we paying so much attention to the housing and living environment and how are we engaging people to help us out in this aspect? Yeah, I mean, homes are, are a sanctuary. Uh, they're very fundamental to our lives, uh, whether in Singapore or anywhere else, actually. Um, you know, with homes, you have stability, you have security, and, you know, for yourself and, and for your family. And so it's quite fundamental. People see housing as infrastructure development. Others see them as a bunch of policies. But actually, if you think hard about it, housing policy is social policy. And what animates public housing in Singapore uh, is that social compact uh, that is between government and the people, uh, between citizens, and between us in this generation and the next generation. Because it affects how we use our land and resources and how we make housing and homes available to people over the generations. So I give you an example, you know, in the early years, there was a social compact by government to people that their housing conditions would improve mm -hmm. from living in squatters that uh, were fire risk, flood risk, poor sanitation, uh, moving them to basic homes, but better homes, better so living environment. This was back 60s. in the early years, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When HGBs first uh, came online. Okay. And the commitment then was to give people housing in order for people to have stability in their lives, raise their families, take care of themselves and, and their next generation, uh, but also uh, a sense of rootedness uh, to Singapore. So some of that compact has evolved over the years, mm. but the sense of ownership, a sense of owning your home, owning a part of Singapore 
continues to be relevant. No one thing may change, but still relevant. But the social compact has evolved over the years. For example, uh, our commitment to seniors, enabling seniors to take care of themselves and their community. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at evolving our social compact on housing for, for younger families as well. There is a, a, a need also for us to look at the, the social compact for persons with disability who want to live independently. I think it's very important uh, for us to kind of take a pause, have deep conversations, reflect on where we are, mm -hmm. and then settle on a social compact that will then impact how public housing will be like for the future. Okay. Um, what are your perspectives on this, Darren? Uh, home ownership did not actually happen until four years after 1960, in 1964, when HDB launched mm. its first flats for sale uh, in Queenstown. Yeah. And then after that, um, I think we, we, we should remember that in the beginning, uh, all flats were rental flats. And then after that, they evolved into home ownership flats because uh, the late Mr. Lee believed that, you know, in order for Singaporeans to feel like they have a stake in the country, they should own a home. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And then it has evolved over the years, you know, in the last 60 over years to what we have today, where the approach today is really very more targeted mm. to specific uh, demographics, specific needs of specific people. Mm. Um, but I think one thing hasn't changed. Uh, the HDB continues to build homes uh, for people. And, um, you know, but there are, there are many other things that we can discuss. Sure, yeah. sure. I grew up in Queenstown, right? Yeah. And when my dad and mom got the flat in Margaret Drive, mm. they were ecstatic. It was mm. like, it's ours mm. for $50,000. Can you imagine? Mm. 50, like, what is that now? <laughs> but I, I understand where you're coming from. It's so amazing because the, the, the sense of pride mm. that is theirs, you mm. know? Uh, Christine, what about your perspectives? Mm, okay, for me, uh, I think the housing sector is definitely something that uh, is very close to everybody's heart mm -hmm. because everybody owns a home. I think in Singapore, it's actually quite um, uh, unique because if you look around the world, not many young people can actually afford to buy a home. Mm. But in Singapore, many young couples, they actually can afford, you know, at least to mm. buy a HDB flat. And of course, uh, over the last uh, year, they uh, just released like the PLH model flats. Mm. These batch of young people, they are very fortunate <laughs> because they get to buy, I would say very nice uh, HDB flats at <laughs> highly subsidized rates. That means they are located at the prime location, like for example, near CBD or mm. so, or City mm. Fringe, but uh, they pay a fraction of what uh, you know people will have to pay if they were to buy a right. private house. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, but of course, there are some some um, you know criteria like longer mm. MOP and so on. Well, as we all know, this is not just sitting around talking. Like, Yay! Wow, that's so good, right? <laughs> we need to discuss about the issues that that will crop up mm. because of whatever is happening right now in Singapore. So this show is called Red Dot Hot Takes, and this is our first hot take. HDB flats are fast becoming unaffordable. Okay, so I mean, some of us might say it's not just a hot take, it's a fact. Because last year, the first five months of last year, 87 flats were sold for over a million dollars, Christine. I think this uh, million dollar flat uh, trend is something that is very interesting because uh, even when I talk to some of the international journalists, they can't believe that a public housing uh, flat can cost more than a million dollars. Mm. Yeah, so I think uh, up to date right now, there are around uh, 800 uh, HDB flats that have been sold for a million dollars. And mm. this year, we saw a record number of about 260 units that have been sold. And just over uh, this nine months, mm. and that is the full number that has been sold last year. So already oh. you see that there are more and more flats being yeah, sold. A bit like dengue. <laughs> 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 yeah. But I would think that, you know, uh, these are very, uh, it's just a very minor um, representation okay. of the full population of million over flats in Singapore. Right. So, of course, when we analyze the data, they are quite different flats. You mm. know, these are maybe your DBSS, terraces and big units. I think, um, yeah, when people hear the word one million, like, oh, you bought a flat for what? HDB one over? So what are your thoughts about this, uh, Desmond? So, indeed, the uh, resale prices going up has been a cause for concern. Mm. And that has fed into worries about public housing affordability, affordability generally. Yeah, yeah. And of course, million dollar flats uh, are headline grabbers. There are reasons why the resale market is as it is today. I mean, firstly, we uh, recognize that this is the echo boomer generation. These are the children of the baby boomers. 
and uh, they are a, a large uh, cohort of young people who are getting married, settling down and wanting their home. So BTO, if there are delays, then they go into the resale market. So that's one. Secondly, uh, we have uh, construction delays, right? Which cause people to say because of uh, the pandemic, there have been delays. That's try to get a home in the resale market. Thirdly, HDB caters to a wide segment of society. Uh, it caters to up to 80% of Singaporeans. Mm. And so a very wide band of uh, incomes, backgrounds, ages. And you have uh, Singaporeans who are older, their high incomes are higher, they have uh, accumulated more savings, and then they want to buy a HDB flat. So some, for example, uh, would have lived in private property or bigger HDB flats and they then sell and then look for another HDB home. Those that have good attributes, that have convenient amenities nearby, you see higher transactions, especially right. in good locations. The million dollar flats, whilst they drive sentiment and feed into market psychology, they, they still remain a, a small fraction of all the resale uh, transactions that take place each year. The resale market and the million dollar flats are a cause for concern, mm -hmm. but we do give uh, significant grants mm. uh, to help families to buy resale flats if if that is what they're looking for right and because of that uh, see 90 percent of uh, hdb homeowners they use their cpf to to pay for the hdb loan and we continue to inject the uh, significant supply of uh, bto housing of course it will take some time for the units to come on stream mm. but our commitment uh, to build up to a hundred thousand new hdb flats between 2021 to 2025 so that also will play a part in addressing uh, HDB resale prices as a whole. Uh, having said that, uh, we continue to keep a close watch on the property market, mm. always ensuring that uh, it uh, is in line with economic fundamentals. But I think people are a lot more cautious. Outlook is more sober. Mm -hmm. The economic outlook, uh, interest rates, all mm -hmm. these things uh, just require us to um, look at our budget, sure. be a bit more prudent mm -hmm. and ensure that we buy a unit that's within our budget. Okay, all right. Well, um, Darren, what are your perspectives no, on this I'm, then? I'm not a real estate expert. So when it comes to prices, I'm not uh, so good at that, but I, I have lived in uh, several HDB flats in my life. And, uh, and the fact is that um, prices have uh, been increasing, um, not just on the resale market, but also for new flats, for BTO flats. Uh, they, are, they are in a whole range of locations. Yep. Some are in non-mature estates, some in mature estates. Uh, we want to make that available as public housing rather than private housing that would you know, be priced for only certain segments because public housing be priced for affordability and provide grants. And remember that people who buy there will also have potential upside. And so you need to price it uh, to affordability, but also recognizing that the people buying that Right, don't get the kind of windfall that make other Singaporeans quite unhappy. Right. Yeah. So what you're saying is that in these locations like the Amokyo one, mm. the pricing is a bit higher because of its location and mm. the amenities around it, so that the people who apply for it um, don't get the windfall effect if they just happen to get it at the same price as something much further away. Well, certainly when we look at the BTO that we launch, we need to bear in mind what the market prices of the units around there are. All right. But we don't price based on market. Yep. We make significant adjustments and put in a lot of subsidies to ensure they remain affordable. And, and the different uh, flats in different locations cater to different segments of the 80% right. of Singaporeans. So the whole range of incomes and budget levels that we provide mm. and people who, who buy homes there uh, already enjoy significant subsidies mm. like everybody else. Yep. Okay. I'm very interested in the, you You mentioned the grants, right? Yes. So yeah. Christine, what do you think about these grants that, that are being doled out? Maybe when I first bought my HDB flats, um, at that time, there were not so many grants available. <laughs> so again, I think that this generation of uh, young people are very fortunate. Uh, but of course, based on some of the feedback that I got from some of my colleagues or friends who have uh, you know, recently applied for the HDB mm -hmm. flats, they're saying that although there are a lot of grants available, but not everything is um, uh, applicable to them. Indeed, we, we hear that feedback uh, and of course meet people who, who share with us their, their housing challenges. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole range of uh, grants and subsidies and of course the resale market as well as the BTO uh, supply. And uh, we constantly review our schemes, our grants and our programs 
to cater to uh, different segments of S Singaporeans. And so we, we bear that in mind <laughs> and continue to yeah. enhance and to improve mm. the overall offering that we, we give because we are providing uh, homes, mm. we're providing a sanctuary for people and catering to very, very different needs. But I have to, mm. maybe I'll just add one more point. Sure. Just now when you mentioned about the uh, increasing prices for BTO flats, mm. uh, because recently I've uh, just uh, examined some of the numbers um, and I find that actually the increase in the, the price is not a lot. To be honest, uh, especially if you compare it with the percentage of increase in terms of HDB resale flats. Because from what I understand is that uh, for pricing of BTO flats, I think they do look at the valuation of surrounding mm. HDB resale flats. So I think in that sense, I think that it's still quite um, fair. We have to keep in mind what the market value of a comparable unit nearby would be. I mean, you must have a reality check. And then you apply the, the support and the subsidies needed to bring the prices down to affordable levels. And affordability would be what your debt servicing ratio would be, is how much of your mm. income goes to servicing homes. And in terms of uh, uh, resale prices, uh, the last two years, of course, yeah. there's been con concern amongst people. Yeah. Headline million dollar flats, but of course, resale prices as a whole going up. Mm. But if we actually cast our mind back, uh, this is the last two years of pandemic. But for six years before the pandemic, the resale market for HDB has been soft, has mm. been flat, has been falling. And, mm. and you know, when we talk about uh, the housing market, uh, we want to provide for home buyers, but we are also mindful of the concerns of homeowners. Mm. So when the resale market is soft, you know, homeowners are concerned about servicing their loans, whether they're positive or negative equity, mm. uh, whether they're able to cover their cost if they need to sell and move, say to get a bigger home. Then on the other hand, you also want to make sure that uh, not just the BTO supply, but the resale market is affordable. Mm. So you, it's, a, it's a balancing it's a act. Balancing and basically act, yeah, you yeah. want stability in the market. And mm. truth be told, the last two years uh, mm. pandemic uh, has kind of thrown a lot of things yeah, uh, asunder. You know? the pandemic, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And we need to make sure that we uh, keep the property market as a whole mm. in line with fundamentals. Uh, so that people uh, remain prudent overall and uh, protect Singaporeans as they uh, buy a big ticket item, mm. item uh, like a home. We've been talking so much about BTO, 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 right? And then some people have been saying on the ground that, wow, I struck 40 easier than getting a BTO flat. Uh. And it's a fact because, I mean, my, a friend of mine, and it's, it's a true story, he's, he, he said for three and a half years, he's been trying 13 times still haven't got his flat. He wants to move out of his mom's place, get married and settle down. So there's obviously a demand, right? The, so the wait times mean that there's a shortage to be catered to. And I'm, okay, look, we built Changi Airport Terminal 5 in anticipation for more air traffic. So why can't we do this for BTO as well? So this is our next hot take. There are better ways to allocate flats than the BTO process. Okay, so let's have a little chat about that right now. Um, prices are going up, waiting time is still long. What is being done? Or should we just say, how that it, this is the new normal, we just accept it. Desmond? Well, certainly uh, the last two years have mm. been challenging uh, for families you know, who's, who have made plans to settle down. Delays have affected their, their life plans. But HDB is working very hard to make sure that the BTO construction remains on track. Uh, we want to make sure though that the process is safe and the homes, uh, quality homes. So, so, so that's a balance to strike. Uh, but the last two years have been tough on construction sector as a whole. Uh, going forward, the uh, median waiting times for BTO flats will be between four to four and a half years. There are of course shorter waiting time flats that we, we launched previously with uh, two years, two years plus you get a flat. So we're very appreciative that Singaporeans understand the challenges that uh, our construction sector faces mm -hmm. and we keep them updated. But in terms of uh, BTO flats and, and applying for them, we give significant priority uh, to those buying their first home. This could be young couples mm -hmm. looking for their first home, wanting to settle down uh, because they bear in mind the weight for, for those homes. Just give you a statistic uh, for say a first time home buyer buying a BTO flat, about 90% of first-timer couples would get their BTO flat if they apply in a non-mature estate on their second try, right? So mm -hmm. by, by the second try, 90% of those buying a BTO in a non-mature estate will be successful. And virtually all will get 
a chance to select a flat in a non-mature estate on the third try. Of course, if you want to go into a mature estate where desirable attributes, the estate is mature, and uh, of course there are fewer of such units, demand is much higher, virtually all will get their a BTO if they are first time home buyers by the time of the third try. Because they get more flats allocated to first timers and more chances and more ballots given to them. For no mature estates already, every BTO supply, 95% of the units are set aside for first-time home buyers, 95%. Mm. And recently in the August BTO, we upped that for non-mature estates as well. Previously 85%, now for first-time home buyers for couples, 95%. For singles also, we've uh, increased the uh, supply uh, eligibility. So for two-room flats in non-mature estates that are not set aside for seniors, now up to 65% of the flat supply is, okay. uh, is kept for singles. Mm. So we provide uh, housing support for first timers, not just by giving them more ballot chances because mm. of priority schemes and the fact they're first timers, and of course the grants that go with it, but also by carving aside and dedicating a significant proportion of what we build for first timers. And the flat supply coming on stream is significant, as I said earlier, mm. uh, up to mm. 100,000 over this five year period. It's a, it's a major endeavor. But bear in mind that also we have eco boomers buying their homes, large cohort. But secondly, also families are changing, you know, Jose. Yeah. You know, in the past, you see much larger families, three generation families, mm -hmm. all staying together. But, you know, in this day and age, more people the aspire to space. Shrunk. More singles yeah. staying single, right? Mm -hmm. By choice or circumstance. Also, mm -hmm. one thing to, to buy homes, two room uh, flexi flats mm -hmm. now. And of course, of course, going into the resale market, singles mm -hmm. can buy. Uh, resale flats of any type. Mm. Um, and so all in, it's not just new families coming into BTO mm. market, but you know, social evolution and change, demand goes up because families get smaller mm -hmm. and families become more nuclear. Yeah, and also, I mean, society has evolved for different kinds of family structures, um, singles mm. who, who need to, to be on their own, mm. um, et cetera. So Darren, what are your perspectives on this? So again, it's historical. Uh, remember there was a time in the 1990s where there were more HDB flats than there were people who wanted mm. to buy them. Yes. So it's, uh, it's a time that the young today will probably not ever believe ever happened because- 30 over years ago. Yeah. How is it possible where there were empty HDB flats <laughs> waiting for people to buy? Mm. But there was a time when it was like that. And uh, the government had to put in a lot of incentives for people to move to places like Woodlands and Yishun because <laughs> many of those places had built flats and they were empty. Yeah. Yes. So after that, uh, what happened was, you know, there was an oversupply which uh, then led to the HDB slowing down its building process. Mm -hmm. And in the early 2000s, uh, we, we had another crunch mm. where waiting times were severely delayed uh, because of the fact that, you know, um, the HDB stopped building flats for a while. Um, but the the waiting times today are actually shorter than they were in the early 2000s. Uh, but the pandemic was something that we nobody could have expected. And uh, that has hamstrung the process. Do you think uh, that there will be a time uh, in the near or medium term where, where the supply of flats would, you know, come back to somewhere near the 90s. <laughs> I think we have to uh, manage this carefully because if you're in that kind of situation, you, you're, you're clearing land, you're putting resources yeah, yeah. to build and hold those flats uh, when there's no demand. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if you've entirely all BTO, then of course you have to wait a couple of years before your flats arrive. Mm. And I think what we are working towards, of course, the pandemic had thrown a spana in, in, in the works. I mean, who wasn't affected, right? Uh, is to have that balance, right? BTO flats, shorter waiting time flats, uh, building more of them so that those who need their flats more quickly, especially first timers who are setting up home, just wait two years, two years plus, you mm -hmm. get your home available. Uh, and then of course, a healthy stock of uh, balanced flats, mm -hmm. uh, that's available for open selection and uh, a resale market, which just provides options mm. all over all over Singapore. 
And I think that that is what we should work towards, including building a lot more shorter waiting time flats mm -hmm. uh, when the mm. situation stabilizes. Okay, yeah. looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> Christine. Mm. Well, uh, my personal opinion is that um, you know the situation that we are seeing now is actually quite unique because it's not something that I think that um, is planned. So, for example, like what Desmond has said, you know, is because of the pandemic, and unfortunately, after the pandemic, we have the Ukraine Russia war. Mm. You know, that has caused like the escalation in terms of a uh, cost of construction. Of course, uh, when we talk to our counterparts, you know, in the construction sector, they say that, you know, steel, iron, mm. you know, a lot of these raw materials are very expensive. So this is not something that is just unique to Singapore, but um, all over the world, mm. I think um, it's a concern mm. for the, the construction sector as well. So, for example, right now, uh, I think just now you mentioned about, you know, um, having more flats in the non-mature estates. I think the narration may um, change because initially, I think a lot of people want to stay in the mature estates, yeah. uh, mainly because of the ample amenities. They want to be near their parents and so on. And of course, because of the million dollar flats, you know, that they are seeing. So many of them, maybe they may want to buy one mm. because they of the investment value and so on. But I think moving forward, uh, perhaps more people may be shifting to the non-mature estates, uh, especially since you know connectivity has been improved yep. with all the MRT lines coming up. I think the idea of a non-mature estate many decades ago, you know, it's very different from what you see today. Yes, you know, true. Uh, open land, Ulu. you know, far from any everything yeah. else. No MRT, yeah. no bus. Just swamp nah, land. No hawker one centre. <laughs> as we, as we yeah. improve Singapore, right, we put the amenities, MRT uh, uh, mm. networks, uh, uh, thicken, mm. uh, we put in more parks, amenities, polyclinics, schools, shopping malls, workplaces, mm -hmm. the second CBD, all these things just make the whole of Singapore more livable. Mm. And of course, then there will be uh, lots of areas well beyond what you traditionally view as core, mm. uh, a central area, or even the mature estates. You start to see um, uh, more parts of Singapore, you know, just looking better, mm. being more convenient, having more amenities, and therefore people aspiring to, to, to buy homes there. That's wonderful. All right, we're going to move on. Um, because we were so excited about singles buying flats, right? So I was thinking to myself, this next hot take, right? We should just scrap the age limit for singles buying BTO flats. I mean, look, 11, 11 is coming, right? So, you know, can buy a flat. So what do you think? Should we just scrap this age limit? I mean, Right, give everyone a fair, fair go at getting their own flats. If we had no constraints, you know, land, resources, space, uh, we're no constraint. We want to provide housing uh, for every Singaporean household. Mm -hmm. you know, and because Singapore society is getting more diverse. But you know, we are HDB and we are a major provider of housing to ensure housing affordability. Quite unlike many other countries in the world, we are only this big. Uh, and our land uh, has to meet so many needs. Housing, you know, just couples, seniors, larger households, which include married couples with children, with parents, three generation families. So we make sure that we, when we provide new BTO flats, all right, with the limited resources and land that we have, uh, we cater first to those with greater needs. So larger household types, okay. not just married couples, but larger household types. So three gen families may include singles. Singles may be looking after parents. Married couples may have children, may have parents, you know, to, to care for. And, and so we provide that. Eligibility for singles, housing options for singles, a growing group of Singaporeans uh, has grown over the years. Mm. Today, singles can buy resale flats of any size anywhere in Singapore. Uh, Singles eligibility to grants have evolved over the years, bearing in mind that singles uh, who live near their parents but not with their parents also need some support in terms of grants. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, as we cater to different demographic of Singaporeans, we ultimately, when it comes to BTO supply, need to apply some constraints so that we can support those with larger household types, mm -hmm. larger household sizes. Um, and uh, over time, where possible, we will cater 
cater to Singaporeans with 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 other needs as well. Yeah, um, well, I think that uh, if I'm not wrong, there was a suggestion to lower the age to about 28 years old or something. Mm. That is a very interesting thing because uh, we don't really know how they come about, you know, 35 or 28. So for myself, I went on to look at uh, Department of Statistics. What is the what is the average age? that most people get married in Singapore. And uh, based on the data for last year, um, I think for males it's about uh, 31, 31 years old, for females it's about 29. So if that is the maritable age, right? What if we allow singles to buy BTO flats at 28? So uh, I was just thinking, you know, if let's say, uh, you know, the, the husband and wife or boyfriend, girlfriend each owns a BTO flat, maybe two or three years later, they decide to get married, mm. you know? Then what's going to happen to the BTO flat? You know, maybe both of them will be um, resale will, one million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, oh no, don't really think so. But uh, but for these people who buy, you yeah. know, uh, they'll be subjected to the MOP fire MOP. Mm. So they'll they'll likely be buying a smaller flat. So what happens after getting married? You know, then if they want a bigger flat, then they'll be stuck. Mm. So this is something that I would think that you know uh, perhaps can bear that in mind in terms of uh, deciding what is the age cut off. But of course, uh, I do see uh, some of the needs of these uh, younger Singaporeans, singles, right? yeah, mm -hmm. singles, you know, they, they also want to own a home. So perhaps they can maybe can allow them to buy slightly bigger flats in non-mature estate. But of course, like you mentioned, we have to clear the backlog first uh, because of the pandemic. But I think moving forward, I'm sure um, some things will be done to help them. Now that we're on the topic of catering to all demographics, mm. uh, I, I wanted to bring this up about yeah. those Singaporeans who really cannot afford to own a flat. Right. Uh, what about them? You know, uh, we know that um, the HDB has uh, a public rental housing scheme. Yes. That's been ongoing since the beginning. Mm. Uh, and it too has evolved uh, over the years. Mm. And, and there was actually a time uh, in the 1980s where the HDB stopped building new rental flats because they wanted to encourage every Singaporean to try and own a flat. Um, but with, you know, rising inflation, with the pandemic and with all these things that are happening, you know, we've realized that there will be a segment of society of people that, you know, by no fault of theirs, uh, are going to be left behind in terms of their, their income levels or their ability mm. to find a job and things like that. Mm. And, um, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what the HDB is doing in order to, to help these uh, very specific group of people? Significant grants and subsidies that are tilted in favour of lower income households to make it affordable. Uh, but you're right, there are some families, there are some individuals, because of life circumstances, housing, affordability, home ownership, not for them. Yes. All right. Mm. So some would be, say, seniors who have disability, for instance, or suffering from uh, dementia, they've got no family support. Yeah. I mean, if, if they can live independently, that is. If mm. not, then of course, there are other uh, care options for them. Yeah. Uh, but even younger couples, you know, because of life circumstance, they're not ready for home ownership. We try very hard to provide support, but if they're not ready for home ownership, then the public rental scheme, as you rightly pointed out, is available as a safety net. Uh, and these uh, are very affordable, but we try to help them attain the aspiration of home ownership eventually. So we have a housing support team, mm -hmm. a group of my colleagues uh, who work closely with low income families in rental flats to help them work out the steps needed in order for them to achieve their goals. So for example, last December, I, I, I went to visit a the family. They had lived in a rental flat for close to a decade, you know, husband, wife, I met them and their three children in, prim in uh, primary school. So the children grew up in a rental housing uh, environment. And the father wanted to overcome his challenges uh, in order to ultimately be the owner of a home for, for his family and provide for them. So. Right. Uh, and so HST worked with, with him. And uh, by the time I visited him, he had already settled into his new uh, resale flat. They helped him with grants, they helped him with... Uh, the process, and eventually he was a proud homeowner. And then of course, for second timers, you know, who, who aspire to own a home, but have been in rental housing because say they've lost their first home because of debt, because of mm. life circumstances. Uh, we have the Fresh Start housing scheme. Yep. Uh, and and, the, and the, 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 the key uh, element in that program is the Fresh Start housing grant. And uh, earlier this year, we enhanced the grant. 
raising it from $35,000 to about $50,000. And we now provide even three-room flat, aspire to provide three-room flat, so they have more space. Uh, so, so that is the commitment that we have to helping lower-income families living in rental housing uh, to own their first home. And so to community link, HDB rental housing combined forces with uh, the, the social support, healthcare support, community support, in a family-centric way, looking at the family, their goals and aspirations, but also their fears and worries, working out a progress roadmap for the family, then weaving in and integrating the support that is needed for them to be stable mm -hmm. as a family, then pick up the elements of self-reliance, skills, training, experience, and then job matching. Then ultimately, with the support of the uh, Comlink team and the housing support team uh, towards home ownership, if that is a major part of the aspiration. The success rate has been okay so far? I mean, the, the yeah, what, what's it like? So Comlink has been building up over the last few years. Okay. We are working and reaching out to families, understanding their uh, strengths and their aspirations, mm -hmm. but also their gaps and difficulties they face, and working assiduously uh, to mm -hmm. make sure that young families living in rental flats see rental housing not just as infrastructure, mm -hmm. but with the assurance of social support. And so, so more work coming up in mm. the years to come. First thing, Darren, we were speaking about the social... Yes, so speaking uh, of this yeah, whole idea of um, public housing as a social good, mm. rather than just infrastructure, right? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, the HDB has also taken steps recently uh, to integrate uh, rental communities into BTO and bought flats, uh, communities where people buy their flats. And there's been some feedback where, where there are people who, who feel that this is not the right step because uh, it affects the, the prices, resale prices yeah. of these uh, flats. Um, you know, what, what do you have to say about that? I think uh, through estate design and infrastructure provision, we have this opportunity to achieve important social goals. Because in society, there will always be some of these invisible forces yes. at play. That you leave it to society, you leave it to market forces, it will stratify, it will gentrify, yes. people will live separate lives altogether. Yes. And so starting from the time we did ethnic integration policy, all right, it has its rough edges, we tried to smoothen it, but the whole basic tenet is that if you don't live even next to each other, then you won't even have the chance to interact in those mm, micro interactions mm. in the lift, mm. in the corridor, right. in the market, uh, in the preschools, in the schools. Then how do you even build social cohesion? It will just be lip service. You must create the opportunities. Yes, there will be friction. Yes, there will be mm. uh, unhappiness from time to time. But by and large, people learn to get along and they thrive in celebrating diversity. The same mm. holds true for, for rental housing integration. Uh, we, we have and still do sometimes need to build standalone blocks. But where we can, we try to integrate rental housing with sole housing. And for our first prime location housing, Christine, you remember, we integrate rental flats in the same block. So you come out of the lift, you have sole, sole units, you have rental units. I think with good programming, with good neighborliness, with Singaporeans very open to inclusiveness and diversity and just embracing each other, I think we'll we will want to make this work. Not because just otherwise we will just be closed off. software has mm, to happen as that's well, right? right? Mm. So prime location, public housing is one of those aspirations, building on top of EIP, and of course, integration of rental and sold to the extent feasible, is also uh, a manifestation of the social compact and an aspiration of how society should be in Singapore. So can we expect to see more rental housing in new prime location housing estates in the future? Yes, for sure, yeah. Mm, um, yesterday, I was just talking to some of my friends uh, or colleagues uh, who are doing valuation. So mm. I was asking them, you know, uh, having some of these rental flats in the block, does it really affect your valuation? Mm. So uh, quite interesting because uh, they were saying that uh, when they do a valuation of a, a property, normally they will not really take into account whether there are rental flats around. Okay. So it wouldn't be because your rental flats as your neighbors, mm. so your price go down. Goes down. Well, of course, uh, in reality, uh, some people will definitely have the concern because you know of maybe certain 
issues they may occur mm. because uh, of the environment or whatever. So uh, some people, like for example, potential buyers may take the opportunity to suppress or bring down the price mm. and say, oh, you know, I'm going to ask for a discount because of this uh, rental flats mm. that is in your block. So they are saying that, you know, uh, objectively, um, in terms of valuation, uh, shouldn't have a problem. But of course, you can't stop a buyer from offering you something lower. So, um, but of course, I understand uh, Minister Desmond is saying that, you know, uh, end of the day is also, uh, there are broader concerns, like for example, you know, like, you know, uh, em embracing, you know, uh, mm. another part of our society mm. to be with us and so that we can progress together and yeah, so because on. Because in, in many other countries, uh, low income rental flats have become like really dire, the mm. conditions. And for the older rental housing through rejuvenation and of course over time some of the older rental flats can yep. be located as we build new mm. rental housing mm. yep. whether integrated or standalone in a, yes. a multi-typology estate where the mm. common spaces are shared and people live in mm. close proximity to each other uh, we will continue to improve the older flats including older rental flats mm. i think uh, this idea of uh, refreshing our social compact is not a term in the abstract you know it's not a theoretical exercise mm -hmm. Understanding government's commitment to people, people's responsibilities to each other, and our role as stewards for the next generation will help us better understand how to use our land and resources in a way that keeps Singapore going. And how we design and roll out our public housing mm -hmm. ultimately is a manifestation of social objectives and social policies that are themselves driven by that sometimes unspoken compact. But through this very uh, socially oriented, oriented uh, infrastructure uh, program, we seek to um, keep Singapore inclusive, keep Singapore united, assure people about housing. All along the way, there'll be bumps. Uh, there'll be stresses and strains. Uh, there'll be lots of dialogue and debate, critique, and we welcome uh, constructive views that allow us to keep improving our public housing offering to Singaporeans. On that note, we've run out of time um, for our second episode. It's been really interesting to find out about the bill pillar and what goes under that. So thank you, my guests, uh, Darren, Christine, Desmond. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank and you, of course, you. if you want to talk about more stuff and leave your comments, you can always click on the link in the description. Um, coming up in the next few episodes, we have more pillars to discuss and uh, I'll be very, very excited to meet my new guests in the coming episodes. So We'll see you soon.